Welcome to Pioneer Parent Academy. Today we're bringing to you a video related to our Batesville School District reading focus called RISE. I have with me two guests today, Miss Molly Hill, who is our District Literacy Specialist, and Miss Tina Baker, who is a K-6 RISE trainer. Welcome, Molly. Thank, Thank you for coming you. today. Yes, I'm glad to be here. So first, our question is, what is RISE and what are its goals? RISE stands for Reading Initiative for Student Excellence and we have that here in Arkansas and our three main goals for RISE are to sharpen the focus um, and strengthen instruction. This is for educators where we want to give them great professional development on the science of reading, on how to use data to influence decisions they make in the classroom. The second goal of this initiative is to create community collaboration for our schools and our communities. And third is to build a culture of reading for our communities and for our state. Perfect, all right. Well, tell us a little bit about the essential components of RISE. Okay, so the essential components of RISE are sometimes referred to as the big five. And the big five are phonological awareness, which is kind of an umbrella term. Um, and under phonological awareness, we have phonemic awareness. There's also phonics, comprehension, vocabulary, and fluency. And all of those are essential components of RISE. So we know that one of the most foundational components of reading is phonemic awareness. Can you tell us what exactly phonemic awareness is? Yes, so phonemic awareness, like I said, falls under phonological awareness. And phonemic awareness is recognizing the sounds in words. And we also are able to manipulate those sounds. That's part of our phonemic awareness. And it's essential in reading to be able to link our sounds that we know to the letters that they represent. Okay, perfect. So why is phonemic awareness so important? So phonemic awareness is important because it is a foundational skill that we use as people, as readers, to build our knowledge of letters. So what we're able to do and what you guys will hear later on is that phonics, you can't have phonics without phonemic awareness. So phonemic awareness is, is knowing what sounds you have um, within a word. And so it anchors our reading instruction in what sounds our letters make. Okay. So our kiddos are going to come home and they're going to talk about things that they're learning at school. Yes. And uh, you may hear some terms and things that you might not be familiar with. And what students are really talking about is that phonemic awareness instruction that's happening in their classroom. So what does that instruction look like? Okay, so a lot of our phonemic awareness is going to look like um, breaking apart words, especially in those early elementary years. You might hear the word Hegarty. Um, and our students use that in our early elementary classrooms. And what they're doing there is taking apart sounds. So for example, you could say cat, and then ask for the sounds in cat. So they would say k at. Mm -hmm. And they're breaking apart those phonemes or those sounds within the word. So that looks like playing with words, kind of word games that they're gonna play in class. Um, and they're not even gonna know that they are learning phonemic awareness that they they are you know building such this foundational skill they're just playing word games and they're not really talking about the names of the letters at that point right are we they? are looking at just the sounds and then later linking that to the um, symbols that represent the letter welcome back we have Miss Tina Baker with us, who is our K-6 RISE trainer. Thank you, Tina, for being here with us. Thank you. So our so. first question is, for years, people have talked about which comes first, knowing the letters or the sounds. What is it that RISE encourages? Yes, Laura, that has been a hot topic for many years. And we have learned through our RISE training that through research by David Kilpatrick, Equipped for Reading Success is one of our books that we use in RISE, that we have four processors in our brain. And we, the orthographic processor is the first processor that fires first. So students, when they look at the letters, that is what they use for letter recognition. And then the next part fires is the phonological processor, which is the sound, like Molly talked about with the phonemic awareness. Then we take the letter, we can take it to meaning to know the letter name. And then when letters form words, they can take it to context. And so research now shows us that it's better for letters to be taught first. And then we match the letters with sound relationships. And children need many exposures to their letters. This could be through flashcards. It could be through 
uh, tactile things. They need three dimension. They need to make the letters with clay or look for the letters and know the, the formation of the letters. So it's so important that all the letters, upper and lower case letters, be taught by Christmas of the kindergarten year. Great information. So earlier Molly talked to us a lot about phonemic awareness and that being the most foundational level of reading. So the next level is phonics. And so what is phonics and why is it so important? Phonics is very key to learning to read along with what Molly said, the phonemic awareness. That's the foundation. Then you take the phonemes that they learn in phonemic awareness. It's kind of like building a house, Laura. Mm -hmm. You want a, a great foundation if you're going to build a new house. Same thing with learning to read. That phonemic awareness is our foundation. That's the phonemes. Then we take the graphemes, which is the phonics part about it. When you put the phonemes and the graphemes together, kids can decode. And that's how they can learn to read the bigger words through phonics. And we uh, at Batesville School District, we use phonics first as our phonics curriculum and we have now for about five years. All of our K-3 teachers, special ed teachers, some of our aides are even trained in that instruction. And we use that in several components. We have a three-part drill that's all with uh, learning more about the letters and the sounds. Then we move into the new skill for phonics that day, say it's short A. They move into that, then they have dictation words that the kids, uh, the teacher will dictate and the students write. Then we get into putting the words into sentences. And then we move on into red words, which is our sight word vocabulary. So phonics is key because it takes the um, phonemic awareness and the graphemes, the phonemes and the graphemes together so that kids can decode. One thing that parents are probably hearing a lot about, maybe even seeing their students read, are decodable books. Yes. And that definitely connects to the phonics piece of reading. So what are decodable books and why are they so beneficial? Decodable books are controlled text that we use mainly in kindergarten and first grade. Now, if some students in older grades are lacking the phonemic awareness and the phonic skills, maybe they miss that along the way, then they too can be in decodables. It's all really based on the individual student and how they um, learn the process because you know reading is is not a natural process and so it takes learning the code learning the phonics code to do that and we use those decodable readers to um, like after we've taught the short a sound then we would use the predictable text the decodable reader and it would have lots of short a words in it plus some high frequency words as well so this would be a decodable book would be after the lesson has been taught well, I know many people probably are thinking, well, when does my student get to read authentic text or text of their choice or enrichment text? So when do students begin to read that type of text yes. over decodable text? Yes, usually about second grade is when we transition into authentic text. Some students might transition a little earlier. We first want to make sure they have all of the components to the phonemic awareness where they can substitute and make those initial sounds and uh, medial sounds. We want to make sure they have phonemic awareness and all the phonic skills needed. They need to know the six syllable types. Mm -hmm. They need to know some syllable divisions before they are ready to um, move into that authentic text. So it could be middle of second grade. It might even be beginning of third grade before that happens. Okay, that is wonderful information. Well, the next component of reading is fluency. And so can you tell us what fluency is and what role does that play in a student becoming a proficient reader? Yes, fluency is another key component of our RISE training. And fluency is being able to read accurately with precise, um, and they use prosody or expression when they mm -hmm. read. And usually we measure that through our oral reading fluency measure through dibbles. It can be through any text. It's where they read the students read for a minute and the teacher uh, notes any mistakes the student might be. And then the number of words read uh, divided by the number of words in the passage in a minute determines their oral reading fluency benchmark, so to speak. Right. Yes. Okay. So you just explained to us how that's measured, and so that text that they're reading is not a familiar text, is it? No, it is not. It, it's, a, it's a cold read, we call it, where okay. they, it's, it's new to them. All right. Well, tell us a little bit about orthographic mapping, and how does that impact a student's fluency? Yes, orthographic mapping is a new term for most of us that we did learn through the RISE initiative. Mm -hmm. 
lots of good things really in the RISE initiative and orthographic mapping is where we are building our sight word vocabulary in our students. We want our students, kind of going back to the processor that I talked about earlier in the brain, uh, when a child sees a word, of course they're attending to the letters, which is the orthographic processor, then they're going to the phonological. What happens during orthographic mapping, Laura, is a child sees a word and the first thing they're going to say, oh, this is the letter C, like in the word cat Molly was talking mm -hmm. about. This makes the K sound, so I know that's a C. So they would put the C down. Then they would listen for the middle sound, and that's short A sound, I. And so what they're doing through this process is they're mapping those processors in their brain. That, therefore, it makes sight words. So we want those sight words to be automatic and fluent. And that's another component with fluency. It's not just the reading, it's also being able to look at words through orthographic mapping to say those words smoothly and, and fluently. Right, okay. Well, moving on to the next component, which is vocabulary plays a huge role yes. in reading. Yes. Can you tell us about how vocabulary impacts reading and what instruction would consist of related to vocabulary? Yes, vocabulary uh, is, the, is the road to, to making a proficient reader. Students need to know vocabulary words in order to make meaning out of the text. Therefore, to make meaning out of the text is going to lead to comprehension. So vocabulary is huge. We really have two different types of vocabulary in reading. We have academic vocabulary mm -hmm. that our science and our social studies teachers do a great job of incorporating our math teachers, incorporating that into their subjects as well. And then we have the vocabulary that we would use with fiction books as well. So we have both of those. Teachers are instructed through RISE to teach Tier 2 words, which are those words that they see mo most often, that they will see, we call them high utility words. Um, we even did a little cheer in RISE so that the teachers would remember those high utility words, those words that they're going to see in their reading and that students will use in their writing. Because we know, Laura, when students use those words and they write with those words, then they truly have those words grounded and know what they mean, which leads to a proficient reader. Great information. So another word that we hear a lot in RISE is morphology. A lot of people might not know exactly what that is. Can you tell us what morphology is yes. and how that impacts a student that might be in grades K-2 and then even what it looks like for grades 3-6? Yes, yes. Morphology is word parts and they're meaningful word parts. In K-2, we use it through our prefixes and our suffixes. Like even in first grade, they're teaching the prefix un to know what un means and so they use that with their base word and then they might even add a suffix to the end of it as well. So K2 it's prefixes and suffixes that they use those in. Grades 3 through 6 we're teaching Greek and Latin root uh, parts so that even in uh, science and math they can very well use those Greek and Latin roots in part of their curriculum as well. But when they know those word parts, then they can apply it to their reading and therefore lead to comprehension yes. to a proficient reading again. Yes. Well, what role does oral language play in all of this? Oh, oh that's a big, uh, they're all biggies, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> oral language is huge, even in infancy. I can't stress that enough to parents. Talking to your children, uh, even when they're infants and babies, that is so important. The gooing and awing that you hear with your, with your kiddos, they're really talking to you because you've been talking to them or reading books to them. It's so important uh, as infants and toddlers that we start reading uh, and even tell, and saying nursery rhymes with our students at that age, even before they enter kindergarten. Uh, that repetitive text is so important because when you are talking to your, your students, you are um, doing lots more than you ever imagined, uh, helping them to their educational road to success for reading. Final component of reading, which is reading comprehension. Tell us what is comprehension. Okay, so comprehension is understanding. Um, so you can have that in reading where you're understanding the text that you are reading and then also with that oral language that um, Tina Baker was talking about earlier where you're listening to someone and you understand what they mean and you're picking up on their context clues and you can link your knowledge to what they're talking about. That's much more difficult in reading. So with reading comprehension, it's really important for our students to have background knowledge. 
So what they're doing when they're reading is they're thinking about their reading and they're connecting that to their text, um, their background knowledge to their text, mm -hmm. so that they can understand what the author intended the text to be about. So that they're reading that and they're really understanding it. So that's that comprehension, really understanding what's happening in the text or what's happening in a conversation. So a parent might hear a teacher talk about two different types of comprehension listening comprehension and reading comprehension. Could you tell us a little bit, I think you touched on it a little. Yes. Tell us a little what listening comprehension is and then again reading comprehension. So listening comprehension is when you listen, understanding what that person is saying. So our students, your children are working on that listening comprehension from infancy. When you're talking to them, they're recognizing your facial expressions, they're connecting with you, um, and that happens a little more naturally. Something that we touched on earlier is that reading is not something that we naturally do. And so that reading comprehension is taking all of these different components that we've talked about, putting those together at the same time that you're looking at text, and then understanding that, linking that to what to you know. It. That's a great way to put it. So what does comprehension instruction look like when you start bringing all these pieces together? Right. How is the teacher instructing our students on reading comprehension? So reading comprehension is, it's a big category. Um, so you're going to see that a lot of different ways. There's not one way that's the best way to teach reading comprehension. So what we're wanting our students to do is think about their reading to model some of those internal conversations that they'll have when they're reading, just like we do as adults. When you read, you kind of wonder about what's gonna happen next, or you think like, oh, this is like this book that I read before. What we do as teachers is model that out loud. So what we're doing is showing our students those strategies that they're gonna use mentally. We're gonna do that physically. They're going to be able to hear it. They're going to be able to see it. So when a teacher is teaching, they may be doing a read aloud or shared reading and they may stop. They may pause their reading and wonder out loud and say, huh, I wonder what's going to happen. Or they may say in this book that we read last week, this happened. I wonder if that's going to happen here. And they start to make predictions. Mm -hmm. Teachers will also model um, ways to organize their thoughts, maybe in a graphic organizer. Right. They're also going to pull out different text stru structures. So when we're looking at a fiction text, that's going to look very different from a nonfiction text. And so our teachers teach those strategies and look at the text to gather as much information as we can, because we want our students to be able to think out loud, think to themselves, um, to connect to their text, to ask questions. And then when they're finished with the text, to be able to go back and check their answer, check their prediction to see was I correct? Right. What was different? What was going on? Were my my questions answered? Right. So that's going to look really different in every classroom and every age level. Mm -hmm. um, and that is going to look different at home. When you read a bedtime story, you may ask, you know, a question about something. You are building their reading comprehension just by having them, your, your child, respond to questions about text. Well, how do we measure reading comprehension? So that is a little bit more difficult because it is not a cut and dry answer, just like how we teach comprehension. It's not one, one size fits all, where our students are going to be asked questions and then answer those questions about the text. So teachers can see that in their writing, um, they can see that in their answers, but also that's gonna happen much more fluidly when you're speaking about the text that they're reading. So that happens in conversation, that's gonna happen with your um, graphic organizers that students pull out, questioning, um, just really informal conversations between groups of students as well, right. where are they connecting to the text? Do they understand what the author is wanting them to get out of this text? Right, good, that's great information. So I know many parents are asking themselves, well, what can I do at home to reinforce reading with my students. Can you share some tips or strategies? Of course, of course. Um, we always want our parents to feel supported. We want them to be working um, with their students if they can. Um, and there's some really quick and easy ways they can do that at home. So some things that you're already doing with your students help build up their skills in reading. So reading books to them, connecting them to books that they're interested in. So if your child is super into trains, we have our public library. There's lots of resources at your school um, where you can get your child 
books on trains. So engage their interests through books, through text, and also just talk with your kids. Talk with them about what's going on. Um, you're building that oral fluency, that oral language fluency by talking with them, um, seeing what's going on in their day. When you go on a trip, recognizing just different letters on things and having just um, a focus on sounds, letters, words, mm -hmm. where if you look at it and think about it, you can bring that up to your kid. And uh, there are plenty of word and letter board games. So I don't know if most people play board games like we do. It's 2020, we have a lot of technology, but my family, I have a seven-year-old and a five-year-old, and every night they wanna play games. And so some games that we um, are gonna look at incorporating are things like Scrabble, um, so even if you right. just use letter identification there, um, apples to apples, headbands, sequencing letters, boggle, boggle is so great. I mean, you're just looking at letters and make, building mm -hmm. words. Um, Tall Tales, Zingo, there's, uh, there's an extensive list Lots of just of games. Them. So you would maybe and not- And you could modify right, to make right. Right for whatever age. For your, your preschooler, is. for your, you know, up to your high school student where you can play those and- Sure and kind of modify them and build sure. those skills. Those are great suggestions. Thank you, Molly. Yeah. Miss Tina, Molly shared some great strategies parents can utilize to reinforce reading. What tips and suggestions do you have for parents as they're working to help their kiddo become a good reader? Well, Molly hit some great points, yes. and I agree 100% with all of her points. Reading aloud to your children is extremely important. Kids are never too old to be read to, never. You know, reading bedtime stories at night that is huge. You think, oh, I'm tired. I don't want to read tonight. We'll skip it and do it tomorrow night. And then that night comes and you move it to the next night. Please don't do that. Please take the time to read to your students because doing that makes a powerful impact on our students to want to read, to enjoy books. Because, you know, as parents and grandparents myself, it's our responsibility to be role models for our students and if we want our students to be productive readers then we're going to have to model that ourselves so reading aloud is huge laura i mean i can't stress that enough Absolutely. and and even in junior high and high school i think oh well they can read but you reading aloud even if it's a newspaper article to them or something when they get older that is going to help your students so much so very much that's wonderful information that parents need to know thank you for that we hope that you found this video helpful today and if you have any further questions about how you can assist your child with reading or you have questions in general about the RISE Reading Focus, please contact your child's school, talk to their teacher, their academic coach, and just reach out to us. We're here to help you. Thank you.